Raise your fists together. I am somebody. I may be poor, but I am somebody. Red and yellow, brown, black, and white. We're all precious in God's sight. Everybody, somebody. Stop the violence. Save the children. Stop bullying. Save the children. Pull your head high. Stick your chest out. You can make it. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Hi, I'm Dr. Sonia Whitaker, National Education Policy Director for Push for Excellence. And on behalf of the Rainbow Push Coalition, we'd like to thank you very much for giving of your gift of time and joining us here on our Saturday Morning Forum. We'd like to thank Word Network for bringing you to us and us to you. And yet we recognize there are many of you that are watching us right now on Facebook Live. If you're doing so, we'd like to ask that you like our page. And for the many of you that are watching us right now on YouTube Live, we'd like to ask that you subscribe to our page so that you may gain immediate access to all of the content that we have in store for you. And speaking of content, we can't do this without you. We need your financial support and we've made it really easy for you to give. In fact, you can choose from one of three different ways. You can simply pick up that cell phone of yours right now and hold it to the QR code on your screen and give right on the spot. Or you can simply take that same cell phone and text the word PUSH to 41444. Text PUSH to 41444. You can even go to our website at rainbowpush.org and simply click on the donate button. Now, whatever you do, don't move an inch. Don't touch that dial. Stay right there. We'll be right back because the push is on. Greetings, everybody. It's Dr. Joseph Bryant Jr., the executive director of the West Coast Silicon Valley Bay Area Office for Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson and the Rainbow Push Coalition. And we are inviting everyone to our eighth annual Push Tech Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Conference. Wow, we are so excited. We are going back in person for the first time since 2019. We will be live and in living color at Cisco in Silicon Valley. We are looking forward to a wonderful two-day experience on May 8th and 9th, and we want all of you to be there. Reverend Jackson will be there to celebrate the successes and the progress and the open door that have been made because of his efforts, because of his sacrifices, because of his commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we are so excited to be able to have a wonderful program on Monday, May the 8th, where we're gonna have a tech expo virtual reality, augmented reality. We're gonna have artificial intelligence, the metaverse. All of these wonderful evolving technologies will be a part of the program. We are gonna honor some of our giants that have been stakeholders in this work with us. And of course, we're going to celebrate with special tributes to our very own Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson. It's gonna be a wonderful kickoff event, wonderful program, wonderful speakers. We'll be featuring some of our youth programs, our outreaches, and some of the amazing Amazing work that Reverend Jackson's has helped to lay the foundation for. And then on Tuesday, we're right back at Cisco on May the 9th for a full day of content, diversity, equity, and inclusion conversations, panels, professors, DEI leaders, those who are in now C-suite positions, helping to navigate pipelines for opportunities. And there will be networking opportunities for you. There will be scholarships given away for students. There'll be connections made with companies that you want to tap into. And so we ask you to register today for our Push Tech Conference, May 8th and 9th. Click us, hit us up, go to the website, Silicon Valley's website is rainbowpushsv.org, or you can hit the QR code, you can hit the link, but more than anything, be there in Silicon Valley at Cisco, May 8th and 9th with Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson and Rainbow Push, Push Tech, 
2023. See you there. This is Bishop Tavis Grant, the Acting National Executive Director of the Rainbow Push Coalition, and this is State of the Movement. Across the U.S., currently, there are 892 hospitals, more than 40% of them in rural areas, and they're in and on the brink of shutting down. These high-risk closures in some of the most critical areas across our country Early reports show that 300 hospitals now are on what is called high risk watch because of non-patient service revenues, local taxes, and the removal of certain state subsidies, anywhere between 53 to 68% of the nation's hospitals are now in trouble and are operating in the red. Now, hospital closures have been disproportionate as it relates of their impact on certain communities and certain patient populations, particularly with black and brown communities, and even more so in urban and rural areas where racially segregated communities, especially black and brown communities, are impacted adversely as it relates to these gaping holes in services, resources, and much needed medical attention. The effects on these communities is devastating as research has indicated. Nationally, urban centers where African Americans receive their primary care or where they receive primary services from a hospital those services now are in dire straits. When we look at seniors and pregnant women and those who are critically ill, when transportation is a premium and there is a lack of accessibility to affordable transportation, mobility becomes a great task for one to overcome as it relates to maintaining sustainable medical services. In rural areas, there are 200 hospitals that are days away from closing because of the rising cost of providing care and low financial reserves and little to no profit margin. Investment companies are coming in to buy these hospitals for just the real estate alone. Hospital closings can be attributed to many factors. One, the ongoing inflation and financial struggles in many of the communities where these hospitals are located. Many hospitals, particularly those in urban areas and rural areas, face financial difficulties due to declining patient volumes, a reduction in reimbursement rates, and the increase of operating costs. These all together create a perfect cocktail for there to be devastation, for there to be neglect, and for there to be crisis in the hardest hit communities in our nation. The other challenge is workforce shortage. There is actually a lack of qualified healthcare professionals that in these hospitals where they struggle to maintain a necessary imperative staff to provide adequate services and care. The ongoing nursing shortage and physician burnout coupled together has raised this to an epidemic of crisis in proportionality like we have never seen. Last but not least, industry consolidation. Larger healthcare systems often acquire struggling hospitals to expand their reach and gain a greater footing in the scale of the economy in these particular areas. Unfortunately, 
This is a failed attempt that leads smaller hospitals that are less profitable to closing even faster. And then there's the shift towards outpatient care. And so as a knee-jerk response to the Affordable Health Care Act, also known as Obamacare, in many states they shifted the care service network to an outpatient network using technology and changes in reimbursement policies that led to an increased focus on outpatient care, which is not necessarily to have been proven to be as effective as serving populations, particularly those who are facing critical and chronic disease. Across the board, there's been this move to limit access to health care. You see, with hospitals closing, residents often have to travel long distances to receive care, to receive services, and this creates another barrier to access, particularly for those who are unemployed, with little to no income, and the elderly and we must account for those disabled individuals, which causes communities now to be focused on emergency care. You see, in emergency rooms, timely access to healthcare services is critical. And hospitals are now choosing to shut off and sever emergency room services because they can no longer respond to longer wait times that delay care and cause patients to go into life-threatening conditions. Last but not least, the economic repercussions. Hospitals are often significant employers in their communities, such as the case 10 years ago when we saved the Rosalind Hospital that, high, that, that, that employed 350 persons right there from that community, and yet had it closed. 350 families would have lost homes, 350 families would have lost income, 350 families would have lost jobs. This exacerbating economic struggle creates vulnerabilities in the healthcare network that oftentimes are hard to overcome because of the disparity in care and the disproportionate effect it has on minority and low-income communities. And so Rainbow Push, under the leadership of Reverend Jesse Jackson, is calling for a moratorium on hospital closings. We must look at the fact that we cannot come out of the worst pandemic in this era and allow persons with pre-existing conditions who don't have adequate health care, don't have adequate transportation, adequate housing, do not have adequate community services to perish because of a closed hospital. This billion dollar industry has got to find a better way than causing those who need it most to suffer more and to go without while those at the top benefit from the profits, the sales, and the investments that are associated with these closings. We believe that when you look at the pattern of inequity and the disparities that are associated with it and its impact on black and brown communities, we cannot be silent while so many are suffering poor neighborhoods, poor schools, with no access to capital, no access to resources, no access to services, cannot be left to die unheard, unseen, with questions that are unanswered. And so we here at the Rainbow Push Coalition are fighting across the country. It's what our annual 2023 conference and convention will be all about saving America, saving urban America, saving rural America, because there's no better time than now to fight for the poor, 
instead of fighting the poor. It is our mission to respond to the call and the challenge and the cause to save what we have as we keep hope alive. This is State of the Movement. His voice like a call to prayer. The first solo artist ever to reach one million albums for his breakthrough album Calypso in 1956. Striking, charismatic, talented, Harry Belafonte broke barriers on screen and off. That you threw my way has been my friend by night and day. Much of his life focused on the civil rights movement. A close friend of Martin Luther King Jr., he would perform at some of his rallies. Our great friend, one of the great artists of our age. Harry Belafonte, who will carry on the program. In 1963, Belafonte helped organize the March on Washington. As artists and as human beings, we rejoice in the knowledge that human experience has no color. Always a guiding force for younger artists, he brought the biggest musicians of the 80s together to create the all-star group behind We Are the World to fight famine in Africa. Those musical giants paying homage to him in the middle of the recording session. Belafonte addressing the fight for equality on GMA in 1981. Because of my political or, 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 or social beliefs. But when I measure what my commitment must be to mankind, I don't think there's any question. If uh, There's no choice between freedom and uh, employment uh, or, or money. The Belafonte family saying to the world he was a legend, but to us he was dad, Harry, far, far, which means grandpa in Danish, and he will always mean the world to us. Well, welcome to Push Excel. I know you thought I was going to say Rainbow Push Coalition. Well, you already know this is the PUSH Saturday Morning Forum. What I want to talk about is PUSH for Excellence and why you and your children and even you personally should be involved with PUSH Excel. We are the education entity of all of the PUSH entities. We provide uh, technical education. We provide STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, education. We provide uh, professional development for educators teach and t particularly in teaching educators how to use the new technology so that to teach with we have a, a virtual uh, african-american history curriculum which allows teachers and students to be immersed in learning uh, our history and how we have impacted american history how it is uh, we go from africa to 1619 and from 1619 throughout the years of slavery, through Reconstruction, through Jim Crow, through the lynching years, and how our students of all cultures and races can see the investment African Americans have made in the history of America. So that's, that's one thing that we have. It's part of our Saturday uh, educational project. Every Saturday we are open to teach our young people African American history. We also have a, an oratorical program for elementary students. We help our young people learn to speak correctly, how to engage in uh, a dialogue using uh, the historic speeches of many uh, African Americans and other uh, people all around the world. They'll learn some of the great speeches of, 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 uh, of our day and some of the great speeches of our past. We'll, we, uh, our students will uh, memorize and embody these speeches as they learn them and then they engage in competition creative competition to uh, see who uh, wins the oratorical comp contest and so we want you wherever you are you can have your young people because we teach it virtually participate in our oratorical program 
our STEM program, we have the capacity with our STEM program to have uh, young people learn all sorts of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, how they can also learn that virtually. But in Chicago, in Chicago, you can bring your young people to uh, our national headquarters and they will become immersed in this technology. They will become engaged in this technology. They'll begin to see how this technology works in the workplace, in, in school, how it will help them think differently, see the world differently. And so what are we teaching? I know you're wondering, what is it that your child, your student, uh, your neighbor can get if they are enrolled in the Push Excel STEM program? Well, they'll understand how science is in every facet of our lives. They will understand how technology impacts us uh, at home, at school, in community, at church, everywhere you go, we're impacted by technology. And so they will begin to see this technology and be able to use it, program it, not just buy it and play with it. They will learn how technology shapes uh, everything that we do. One of the things that they will learn uh, in our STEM program is how to program computers, how to program robots. They will learn about uh, flying drones. So we may have some young people that want to become uh, pilots. Some young people say, well, I want to work in air traffic control. They will learn all of that in our STEM program. This summer, we're launching our eSports curriculum. And what does eSports mean? It means they will learn driving, they will learn engineering, they will learn how cars really function. They will learn a lot about uh, reading maps, understanding fuel, uh, so they will be, get better in math. They'll be much better in uh, analyzing things. They will learn team building because we're building pit crews who will be racing esports like NASCAR virtually. We have cars that have steering wheels that they will build so they will understand the construction of the automobiles that they ride in, that their parents drive. And then we are pushing our young people into this engineering space, into this technology space. We're teaching robotics, we're teaching esports, we're teaching digital media. Young people want to make music, we'll teach them how to do uh, music digitally, how to be creative. And then I know you're wondering, we're going to do metaverse. What does that mean? They will learn this new, uh, this new universe that's virtual where they can host uh, virtual parties, much safer than going out. They can host uh, virtual events, much safer and much cheaper than having to. You can have your child's party virtually in what we call STEM City Chicago, or it could be a STEM City in your area. If you want your child to learn uh, STEM, STEAM, you need to send them to PUSH. We look forward to seeing you every Saturday. We're there from nine to one. We're teaching all sorts of STEM technology. And I know you're saying, you're just talking. Well, I want to show you what, we, what we're offering to your young people. Watch this. I'm actually going to be a facilitator and coach, driving coach, for the STEM program here at PUSH. And what I, my role is going to be is to help the students to learn the engineering aspect of building the sin for which they're going to be driving. Also, we're going to be teaching them how to drive, the aspects of racing, the fundamentals of racing, and how to teach them to compete at esports and sim racing. Everything, everything they get involved in at an early age makes it easier and more uh, uh, engaging for them to assume and to learn. But with the eSport driving aspect, it will allow them to, number one, appreciate driving, to bring together some of the things that they've seen with their parents driving and, and how they can learn and attribute that towards doing something a little bit more fun, a little bit more uh, uh, exciting, which is driving. A lot of folks that look like us don't think that they can become a part of that, which we're bringing the, to them the aspect that they, they can. They can not only compete, that they can thrive and survive and become winners and champions and do things uh, uh, more in the driving arena. Bernard Key, Bernard Key in the program, they're gonna be learning aspects of, of metaverse. They're gonna be learning about the usage of NFTs and non-fungible tokens. We're gonna to be teaching them about financial literacy, which is very important in our youth and our, our, our society today, and um, give them opportunities of, of how to gain 
aspects for their future. So give them just other opportunities besides what they normally see in an other average sport that most of our kids learn. The times we're gonna be here are gonna be from, <clears throat> from 10 o'clock to one o'clock here at PUSH on uh, um, Drexel. And the time we're gonna be starting after April 22nd and be going, going on through the summer. So it's gonna be a summer program. So the overall goal is to have STEM programs such as this with our eSports at various park districts, various schools, so that we can develop our own competitive system where we can race against kids, we can build our own sims, they can advertise using their own sims, they can have different designs on their own sims. So we do look forward to seeing some really creative sim building coming out of our teams and also have them race and compete. And of course, as we try to develop sponsorship, then we can also go as mainstream as possible and branch out to maybe citywide and of course nationwide. So it's absolutely an introduction to the kids, but more importantly, we invite the parents, be a part of it, be a part of the program, understand, learn, and see what your kids are doing so that you can guide and you can become a gamer too. I've been a gamer since I was 15, still a gamer at 55. When you shop, Amazon gives. Visit Amazon Smile and select Push for Excellence as your charitable organization by starting your shopping at smile.amazon.com. Push Excel's goal is to inspire students to strive for excellence in education in spite of personal, family, and community challenges that they might experience. How do we do this? By advocating for educational policies that guarantee equal funding for all students without regard to race or economic standing by engaging parents, students, and teachers in pursuing high quality education and striving for educational excellence at every level, and by forging partnerships with community-based and public sector stakeholders in education. Now, Push Excel is a national model program with the purpose of connecting principals, parents, popular personalities, and students in a bond and to support students at every level on the educational ladder. Now we want you to become a member of the Rainbow Push Coalition and Push Excel. Your annual membership can help us to change policies that impact students, colleges, and universities all around the country. So step up and sign up today. Membership is only $35, and if you're a student or a senior, $15. Just go to our website, rainbowpush.org, and push join to become a member or push donate to support the Push Excel program. You can also text the word Push Excel, that's P U S H E X C E L, to 41444 on your cell phone, and you can give us any amount that you feel comfortable giving or call us at 773 256 2775. Wherever you are, you can support us as we keep pushing for you. And remember, to keep hope alive. Trayvon Martin, an unarmed black teenager, was shot down by a white neighborhood watchman who claimed self-defense. Travis McMichael was acting in self-defense when he killed Arbery, and that the pursuit by two armed white men of an unarmed young black man was perfectly legal. And the inspector general notes police brass who signed off on the shooting as justified were able to retire and not face disciplinary action. Black blood by Tim Lee. There's blood on the streets and it's crying out. It's black blood. It's innocent blood. There's blood on the streets and it's flowing out out of the bodies of my black people. There's blood on the streets and it's crying out. Can you hear? Who will hear? There's blood on the streets and it's calling out for we who have ears to awaken. So wake up you sleeping giant. The power within you is needed. Wake up you sleeping giant. We're in danger of being defeated. Awaken the power within your mind, the power within your heart and soul. Awaken the physical power you suppressed. 
and fear that you couldn't control it. Let go of the fear of failure. Let go of the fear of defeat. And with love for your people and love for yourself, succeed or be forced to repeat. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of Sandra Bland and Eric Gardner and Trayvon Martin and Oscar Grant and Freddie Gray and Rakia Boyd and Mike Brown and Tamir Rice and Laquan McDonald and Sean Bell and Jordan Davis and Alton Sterling and Philando Castle and George Meadows and Ruby Stacy and Mary Turner and Jesse Washington and Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith and Reverend George Lee and Lamar Smith and Willie Edwards Jr. and Mac Charles Parker and Herbert Lee and Addie Mae Collins and Denise McNair and Carol Robinson and Cynthia Wesley and Emmett Lewis Teal and Medgar Evers and Lewis Allen and Charles Eddie Moore and O'Neill Moore and El Haj Malik Shabazz and Willie Brewster and Ben Chester White, and Benjamin Brown, and Martin Luther King Jr., and Harry T. Moore, and Harriet V. Moore, and Fred Hampton, and Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor. There's blood on the streets, and it's pouring out. The outpour creates a red pond. The blood of our innocent is shouting out. Black people, will you respond? Now, the next uh, thing that I want you to watch and listen very carefully, we've talked often times about the mass incarceration and how it's the new Jim Crow. Well, that seems like a book that Michelle Alexander wrote, The New Form of Slavery. Well, I want you to hear from two young men who were wrongfully convicted and incarcerated and they're going to tell you the story of how they got to be incarcerated, how the system decided to create a conspiracy to arrest and convict them. So you had the police, the state's attorney then, and, the, uh, and even the judges working together to make sure that these young men were arrested, tried, and convicted, and sentenced to jail. And then they're going to tell us a little bit about what happened while they were behind bars what kind of uh, atrocities they faced behind bars. And yet, for 27 years, one spent 27, one spent 25 years, they were, they were innocent, had not committed a crime, were not gangbangers, so to speak, had never been arrested before. So I want you to hear their story. And so now, after you hear their story, these are the things that Rainbow Push will be looking at from the legal division. We want to reshape public policy that will allow men to be in jail for any amount of time, men and women to be in jail for any amount of time, to learn skills, barber, uh, cosmetology, they learn dog grooming, they learn all aspects of construction, they, they learn how to, uh, to build anything, they learn how to make tires, they are cabinet makers, they make furniture that's used in the Congress and in state offices, and yet, Upon release, they can't find jobs. They can't get in the union with the labor card, yet they have 20 plus years of experience building. They, they, they know how to clean because they clean the facilities that uh, incarcerate them. They maintain those facilities. They remodel them. Some of them are expert painters because they've been painting. However long their sentence has been, they've learned to paint, they've learned carpentry, they've learned plumbing, they've learned all of the trades. And yet, when they get out, they are not entered automatically into the union. So we want to change that policy. Why have me incarcerated and teach me all of this stuff to maintain a facility to warehouse me, but when I return back as a returning citizen, my citizenship is stripped. In many states, they yet they cannot vote in many states. They cannot get a union card, even though they've done union labor in many states. They cannot be cosmetologists or barbers. 
even though they've done it behind bars, they can't do it on the other side of the bars. And so what does that do? It creates a cycle of recidivism. So I want you to hear their stories, and then I want you to join us as we prepare to recreate and expand. It's not the prison outpost, it's the prison policy reform initiative that we want you to be a part of. And we're going to be talking more about it at the upcoming Rainbow Push Convention, July 15th through the 19th. Women, I know you're saying, well, what, the, what, are, what, are, what can women do? Many of these women are single mothers with uh, their children behind bars. This will not be a great Mother's Day for many of them. And so I want women, we have to begin to work together, not to just mourn the absence of our children who end up incarcerated behind bars or even uh, not surviving the street life. We want you to join us as our women's division begins to look at how do we as women reshape public policy, elect people to office that care about families and children. How is it that we can help these mothers that are on the street trying to uh, raise families in the midst of so much crime violence, violence on both sides, violence in the criminal justice system and violence in the streets where they are forced to live. And so if you want to be a part of a movement for change, we need you to come to PUSH. Call us right now, 773-373-3366. Call right now. We want to get you signed up. Come to the convention this year. It's going to be the most powerful convention we have ever had. It's a historic moment. It's the best moment for you to join us as we be, seek to change the way America treats the least of these, our children, our needy families, our homeless population. You come on and be a part of this. But meanwhile, I want you to listen to these young men. It says a lot about our society today and what we must do to change the conditions under which we are forcing people to live. This is a special criminal justice reform segment. I don't think most of us understand what happens once uh, people are arrested, then they're tried, and then they are convicted, and then they are sentenced. I don't think any of us really realize the impact that it has on them, impact it has on families, impact it has on community, especially when they're wrongfully arrested, detained, charged, convicted, and sentenced. And so I have these two brothers who want to share for you their story. Many of our churches, we have testimonies, but we don't have these testimonies that show the impact of this unjust criminal justice system, what it has on families, the children of those who are incarcerated, how it impacts the communities from which they um, originate, and how it says to our young people today, the system's not working and how it negatively impacts black men in particular when they return back home and they're not welcomed by their own children and grandchildren. So I want uh, these two uh, brothers to share with you their stories so you and I can see how it is we must really fight to reform this system. What you're gonna hear uh, from Sean is the problems that you have with a lawyer when you are relying on a public defender oftentimes, or even if you have a, a lawyer that you pay, there's some questions that the family has to start asking and following up. If I'm behind bars, I don't have as easy access to telephones and so forth. You and I who are on the outside, on the other side of the bars, have to start asking questions about our loved ones, talking to these attorneys. And if you have a problem, you can call PUSH because we will get on them and I'll tell you what you can do. I don't want to uh, take away from the story because you were just telling us you were tortured by the same group of John Burge uh, police officers. John Burge was a famous police officer, famous for torture, torturing victims into uh, signing false confessions. Uh, not only was he uh, known for that, he was known for training guys up under him to carry on. So people sometimes get lost in laying it all in Burge's lap when uh, I guess one would say he uh, he planted the seed that eventually grew the new trees, you know, so. Yeah, it becomes like a gang. You have a leader of torture who then creates others, because he couldn't torture everybody by himself. He had to exactly. have a group of police officers and state's attorneys, because the police arrest you, the state's attorney approves the charges. Right. Right? Right. Okay, so now you get charged, and then what happens? And uh, I go in, and like I was saying a little while ago, uh, 
after running across the attorney that Marcus Wiggins had, she bagged up, uh, before she left again, she bagged up to ask me who were the officers. Uh, I didn't know, so I reached out to my attorney who reached out to her. She kept leaning on him to help him with the, letting him know I got evidence. And uh, the end result was he told her to mind the business. I eventually ended up going to trial, got found guilty of the murder, ended up uh, being sentenced to 58 years. And again, this was just, this, this, the wheels just began to roll because now I can see the aggression of the police. I can see why you uh, tried to put Marcus Wiggins on the case with us. You know, like all this started making more you, sense. How old are you then? Uh, I was 17. 17 years old. 17 years old. Never been arrested or convicted of anything. No background, none of that. I no was background. 17. I was going to Harper High School. So, again, uh, I, it's, it's to try to understand that at that age, you can't. So, again, I began to fight and fight, which eventually, uh, with the help of Miss Hall, who went to the public defender's office to add, you know, to, to help me as best as she can with evidence, and she gave me, and years went forward, and I would come to find out the uh, the one witness that I had, she came forward to say that she never seen me a day in her life. She signed the affidavit, three page, saying that the police gave her a picture, showed her a picture of me, and told her to uh, pick me out the lineup that they needed me. Uh, we unraveled that she had been paid money by the state's attorney's office. It's it's. Again, I, I mean, I didn't understand it then, but I understood it moving forward and getting older that this was really, like you explained earlier, it's not no Netflix, it's not TV. This is a real life pay you back for doing the right thing. Yeah. So now, you two are brothers. Yes. Yes, man. How'd you get arrested? Looking for him. They um came looking for him one day. I was at, 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 at my house at... uh. And uh, lo and behold, the dough come kicked in. And uh, mm. the old lady, that the older woman that I was living with, I heard her going through a house. And when I came out there asking and inquiring questions, they, man, who are you? And I told them who I was. And they snatched me up asking about him. And when I told them I didn't know where he was, they didn't believe it. For whatever apparent reason, they didn't believe it. And uh, from that, I sat in prison for 26 years and nine months. They had took me to the police station thinking I was lying about my brother whereabouts. And the honest God truth is what I didn't know he was. And um, from How that- How old were you? I was 18. And um, sorry. So they made you sign a confession? Yes, ma'am. Could you lead a right? No, not at the time. See, a lot of people don't know. So uh, I love to get off in that part because I'm one of the guys who grew up in Inglewood that um, over active, uh, guy who uh, caught the the stigma of having a learning disability. Mm -hmm. So I was put in uh, special ed as a child mm -hmm. and told, you know, uh, no, ain't nothing wrong with you. Uh, yet they took me out of school. And, and I remember vividly them taking me from a class where you read and write at to another class where you build blocks. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And just sitting at the table to build blocks. But, um, you know, just thinking back on that and, and being caught in that aspect of it, uh, you know, and just being thrust in, in, in from 18, being thrust in the prison system. So, of course, like, what do you expect anyone to do being put in a situation like that where you're being snatched out of uh, uh, a family household or whatever life that you were living, uh, an innocent life? Because, again, he, he or I, we, we didn't have no criminal records or nothing. You know what I mean? So being snatched like that and being taken away, uh, I didn't have any witnesses again. I didn't have uh, nobody to say I was there. I didn't have nobody to say I participated in nothing. They didn't even call my mother mm. to get on the stand and say I was her son. It was literally the, the powers that be against me. Mm. So how long were you in prison before you learned to read and write? 11 years. So you get convicted and somehow y'all get sent to both the same prison? How does that happen? Well, throughout the time of being in prison, once you get to prison, you it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a introduction to you go to maximum prisons. We had did our time in maximum prisons and end up in um, in a minimum prison at Sellers. And uh, once we got to the minimum prison, we hadn't seen each other for eight years. I don't want to cut this short, but I do want you all to tell what happened to the family. Some things that happened to your mother. And uh, well, my mother, everything that, that we're speaking about, uh, 
he spoke of it early as to the psychological effects that um, we ask some people to like really logically sit back and think of an African-American woman who had both her eldest children taken away, 17 and 18. Uh, one was eight at the time and the other one I think was 13. But um, she had both her eldest children took away solely from having him turn himself in and, and, and do the right thing. And uh, from that, you know, what we don't talk about is, is her personal things that she went through psychologically into dealing, you know, yes, exactly, uh, and, and physically, and the ailments that came, the physical ailments that came from the psychological pressure that was put on her. So uh, the strokes, she had three strokes, um, all of which had left her unable to talk and uh, communicate with us. So uh, prior to coming home, my mother couldn't talk. Fuck, excuse me. Um, she couldn't talk, so it was, it was, go ahead. He has to explain me. Yeah, uh. He has a reason that he breaks down every time he gets to this part of the story because I don't know if any of us can imagine. You haven't seen your mother for 25 years? 27. 27 years before you could actually be in the same space with her. You get back and she's had three strokes. She's diabetic, mm. among other things. And so then tell what happened. So with, with coming home, which was a, a, a course, uh, out, of, out of all this, I don't want to look past the biggest blessing, which was she did survive long enough to see to both see of us come home. Yes. Mm. You know, yes. so that part was, was a, you know, because, you know, her trips to church, you know, she claimed it, owned it. You know, my sons them coming home. They're going to come home. They're going to walk through these church doors. Mm. And we did so. So that part of it is... Uh, that's a blessing out of this world. I, I don't want to go, but we have to go. <laughs> yeah, do it. Sure. Do it. Okay. Thank you, man. What do you yes. want to say? Close man, uh, uh, I'm a CEO of a clothing line, thought of, created, and prison. And I came out and I pushed for it and I continue to push for it. It's called New Fish and it's spelled N U V I S E A N. Uh, you can find me on Instagram right now at New Vision underscore and, uh, it's all about me, man. I'm struggling, but I don't mind it. I put the work in, I'm all for it. You know, I, for 25 years, I fought to come home. So for 25 more years, I'm gonna fight to go here. Back to you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna ask uh, the director of our HBCU, Historic Black College Tour, if we can buy, maybe have him make our jackets or something for the college students. So we'll buy from him. I'll take that. What you want to say, Chloe? Uh, I wanted to say um, I just I just created uh, Therapeutic Expressions, um, not for profit organization, in which I was speaking to uh, the mayor about. Um, so, Therapeutic Expressions is a not for profit organization that focuses on the psychological development of people in our community. But what it also focuses on is um, trades, um, putting trades back in our community. So, what I what, what I've developed is uh, a geographical as well as financial um, analysis as to the place and what we need to open a um, center for trades. And a center that I'm looking to open through therape therapeutic expressions is a center for electricity, uh, plumbing, uh, barber, whatever it is, trades you can think of, we're looking to put it in here. And as opposed to having our children with guns, I'm saying let's replace them with trades. Okay. No guns, no trade. Thank you so much. I am so excited. We're going to help you. <laughs> Thank Connect you. you to the union. Thank you, sister. All right. Thank you. Labor. Get you a union card. Y'all ought to get an automatic union card. We need to talk about that. <laughs> no, if you already done it uh, for 27 years, I don't know any union trade that has that kind of experience. Oh, yeah. experience. I don't know no psychiatrist or, or no psychiatrist, no psychiatrist or psychologist who sat in a cell with somebody that's sick. No, and I don't know nobody that would. <laughs> <laughs> we was forced to do it. I'm saying that to say that we're the psychologists you know, and psychiatrists. So. <laughs> you got it. This is Bishop Tavis Grant. I want to thank you for being a part of our audience, our viewership, our membership, and it's even a relationship. You know, I see so many of you on a weekly basis. I 
read the reports as I tell you all the time. And first of all, I want to thank those of you who on a weekly basis support us in one way or another. There are so many of you that oftentimes see what we do and read about it in a newspaper, or look at it in a digital um, format or some of our other platforms and you are just amazed that we do so much with so little, but it is because everything you do counts and it starts with you. And your opportunity right now at the bottom of that screen, you can text the word PUSH to 41444 and you can make a meaningful contribution right now to the work of Reverend Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Push Coalition. So many we feed, so many we serve, so many we rescue, so many we bring relief to. And we're thankful that we never have to turn anybody away and we never have to turn anybody off because you are our partner in this cause. You can look at the bottom of the screen. There are several ways for you to give and I wanna challenge you I want to challenge you today. A membership is only $35, but there are others of you. Maybe you can give a contribution of $100, $500, $1,000, $10,000 as we go into one of the most critical seasons this year. So many students, so many families, so many homes, so many seniors, and so many individuals that we dare not turn them away. I need you and Reverend Jesse Jackson needs you right now to make that contribution right now. Maybe you're a pastor, maybe you're a lawyer, maybe you're a doctor, maybe you're an engineer, maybe you're an entrepreneur, and you know the value of making a sound investment for such a time as this. This is the work that we do, civil rights, human rights, and social justice each and every day right here at Dr. King's workshop, we reach the world. And no matter where you are, who you are, we make sure that we represent the life and legacy and leadership of Reverend Jesse Jackson in keeping hope alive. So hey, send that contribution. Go to your phone right now. You can mobile bank right now. Go to that platform at the bottom of the screen and help me help somebody who needs help right now. And I want to tell you, <laughs> thank you so very much for your contribution. And thank you for your partnership. And thank you for your membership as we are keeping hope alive. We're excited to get more people involved in Rainbow Push, supporting the programs of Push for Excellence and the Citizenship Education Fund. If you're interested in impacting public policies, if you believe in the scholarships that we give to thousands of students each and every year, you can become a policymaker by becoming a member of Rainbow Push right now. For an annual membership of $35, or if you're a student or senior, $15, you can help us make a difference in the lives of millions. How do you become a member? Visit our website at rainbowpush.org and press join. Or maybe you'd like to support us. You can text the word PUSH that's P-U-S-H to 41444 on your cell phone and you can give any amount you feel comfortable giving. You can also call us at 773-256-2775 or go to rainbowpush.org and push donate. Wherever you are, you can support us as we keep pushing for you. Dr. Kim, I went to jail with a group of seven students July 17th, 1960, almost 60 years ago. We never stopped moving. I lost a few jail cells and death. We never stopped moving. I thought it was time to write some of it down so the only community members can learn how we did, what we did, and how global it was. Was a speech made by Mandela in South Africa, uh, India, Qatar, by Gandhi in India, uh, here at home. This book tells the story, so please get it to give it to your friends. Read it, let's, let's argue about it, let's discuss it. Yep, so the book is Keeping Hope Alive, Sermons and Speeches of Reverend Jesse Jackson uh, Sr. It's, it's quite a good collection. 
You know, we've got sermons and speeches from around the globe because you have made such a global impact, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. Thank you for tuning in to our International Saturday Morning Broadcast. We need your support. Here are ways to give to Rainbow Push Coalition. Text PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444 to support the work of Rev. Jesse Jackson Sr. and Rainbow Push Coalition. When you shop, Amazon gives. Visit Amazon Smile and select PUSH for excellence as your charitable organization by starting your shopping at smile.amazon.com. So thank you for joining us on our Saturday morning forum. Be sure to visit our website at rainbowpush.org so that you can gain information relevant to our up and coming annual convention. You'll also want to visit all of our social media platforms so that you can gain additional information about all that we have going on in the organization. And equally important, we appreciate your ongoing support. Feel free to take that cell phone of yours and hold it to the QR code on the screen and give on the spot or take that same cell phone and text the word PUSH to 41444 or you can simply go to our website at rainbowpush.org and click on the donate button. We are a sanctuary. We are a sanctuary. When I think of Rainbow Push, I think of two words, social justice. Education advocacy. Political empowerment. Freedom and equality. Corporate partnership. Stop the violence. Save the children. Don't give in. Shut it down. Political change. Inclusion, evolution, progress, justice. Jesse Jackson. Keep hope, keep hope, alive. alive. Keep hope, keep hope, alive. alive. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am. Somebody protect me. Protect me. Protect me. Protect me. Never neglect me. Never neglect me. We want to be bridges to end these cultural gaps. Yeah.